All right, good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming today on this beautifully, slightly cold Monday morning. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping before we start. I mentioned it on Friday, I'll mention it again today. Uh, I'm going to be out of town on Wednesday, so the TA is going to lead the this, uh, lead a discussion section during class, uh, and he'll pass back midterms, so you get your midterms back. Uh, you can ask questions about midterms, questions about the projects, questions about really whatever you want. And I'll be posting a lecture for you to watch online probably today or tomorrow. Uh, so I'll send that out to everyone. Any questions about that? So I've seen the midterm grades. I was actually pretty impressed, which may be bad for you. I don't know. <laughs> if you do too good as a group on the first midterm, that means I need to make the rest of them more difficult. No, 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 that's not so that's not that's 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 When you say it's a joke, it's a joke. <laughs> when you say impressed, like you're like, oh wow, that's actually really nice. Not like I can't. I have never had a class score this low before. Right? Yeah, but then I have to think of why. Why is it? Because it was too easy, or is it because you all studied really hard? I'm gonna go with studied oh, really That's my correct answer. Where did that came from? <laughs> I'm just teasing. All right. So, and we're on to now semantics. So, somebody remind us what is semantics? Words. Is it how you win arguments with people by saying, "Well, actually, semantically, technically, it means." It's a really good way to not. Yeah. Have people how you make sense. Yeah, right? So the syntax just tells us what does it look like to be a valid program? Structure. Structure, yeah, exactly, right? With the context free grammar, right? We actually know how to define that. But semantics gets deeper and it gets into the meaning. What does the thing actually mean? Um, so, when you, how did you learn Java or C or C? What was it? Guided guesses. Guided? Who guide? How did you get guided? Teachers, Stack Overflow, all the semantics of a language available on Stack Overflow, <laughs> various coded questions. Right? So I guess one way is like English, right? So you read something or somebody taught you or explained something to you in English, right? They said, okay, this is what it is, this is what a function call is. How do they tell you what it means to be a function call? Like try to think back to your own education and learning about these things. So what are you doing when you're doing guided guess and check? So who are you guessing and checking with? Do you like go to the teacher and be like, is this a valid program? <laughs> the compiler, compiler. The compiler, right? Yeah, so one way, so one way to define the language semantics is define everything in English. Uh, another way is basically create an implementation of either a compiler or an interpreter and say whatever this accepts is a valid Whatever this accepts and whatever this does is a valid, let's say, Ruby program. Uh, because Ruby used to, uh, I think still kind of is this way, where the official Ruby interpreter, whatever that does is what an actual Ruby program is supposed to do, given that input. And what it doesn't do is not what it's supposed to do. Uh, what else? Are there <laughs> any other ways? So you could sit, do it in English. I could give you a compiler and say this is, this defines the language's semantics. Yeah. You could look at R. You could look at already existing code, yeah, so you could learn by kind of like example, I guess. Um, that could be kind of in the, it's, I guess that's kind of a mix between the two, right? But what's, so what's the problem with English specifications? Yeah. It's ambiguous. Yeah, they could be ambiguous. It's English, right? So you basically, we'll see an example, you basically have to write your semantics like a legal document, <laughs> right, covering every possible use case and then it becomes a little bit more difficult, so you have some ambiguity. So what's another way we could define a language semantics without any minimizing ambiguity? So what's something else besides English that's not? Mathematically? It's not a different language, yeah. Mathematically, right? We can formally model and say, hey, look, this is exactly what a function call is and does. These are the semantics of a function call. These, this is semantics of addition. This is the semantics of uh, dereference. So, uh, so for English specifications, so if you wanted to learn the C99 programming language, that specification is 538 pages long. 
nothing compared to C++. <laughs> exactly, yeah. It's not even thinking about C versus C++, right? It's not even half. You have no objects, no templates, nothing complicated. I, I, I think this is one of the smallest ones. Yeah, that's why I like to show it as an example, right? Because the smallest language still has a huge uh, specification, right? And it has to include things. This is what I mean, you know, lawyerese or legalese, right? But in programming terms, it's saying an identifier can denote an object, a function, a tag, or a member of a structure, union, or enumeration. A type def name, a label name, a macro name, or a macro parameter. The same identifier can denote different entities at different points in the program. A member of an enumeration is called an enumeration constant. Macro names and macro parameters are not considered further here because prior to the semantic phase of program translation, any occurrences of macro names in the source file are replaced by the pre-processing token sequences that constitute their macro <laughs> definitions. So what is this, what is this defining? Just identifier. An identifier, the ID thing that we specified with the regular expression, that was incredibly simple. But this is what it means, and this is telling you exactly what an identifier means. Right? So that is rather long. From, and, but from this, you can know everything. You know exactly where you can use an identifier. Right? You can use it to know objects, functions, tags, uh, members of structures, unions, or enumerations, right? The fields in a structure, uh, type def name. And then it specifically calls out here that, hey, by the way, macros, right, are done by the preprocessor. So it's actually completely before this step. Um, so what's the pros and cons here? Just think about it kind of critically. Wordy. Wordy. Is a, is a con. <laughs> I was going to say, which word does that fall under? It's a con. Do you agree? It's really, really difficult to read and keep track of it. Right, yeah. So you have to, so with wordiness, I guess wordiness by itself is not really a crime. The real crime is that it's hard to understand as the programmer. This is an excerpt of 538. Yeah, this just continues very similarly, I mean, in a different way, right? But it has to be very precise, right? Because otherwise, if the compiler doesn't implement something correctly, but you, the programmer, interpreted it in a different way, you think, oh, I can use an ID identifier in some other way that's maybe not specified here. What are some other problems with specifications? So if I give you this C document, this 538 page document, you read it all. Can you just start writing C code? Mm -hmm. No. No. Why no, not? why not? Why not? Has anybody ever just read the book and then was like, all right, I know how to program C? <laughs> so you know how uh, Steve Wozniak got really good at designing chips, right? He would, like, during school, in school, he would design, like, a chip or a CPU completely on paper. Because he didn't have the parts. He was, didn't have money to buy the parts. So he'd design everything and he'd keep doing it over and over, trying to save parts and do the same thing with using less parts. Wow. Uh, so he would do it all on pen and paper with the specifications of what each component did. So is it possible? <laughs> yes. But what are, the, what are some of the pitfalls? For those of us that have tried to write a complete program and then run it right away. It doesn't necessarily, this tells you the, the specifications tells you everything that it does do, uh, but it doesn't necessarily preclude what it shouldn't do or how to avoid errors or bugs or seg faults. You, you can't verify. Verify what? The, the correctness. Of who? Of the code. Of well, whose code? Your code. My code. <laughs> right? So, okay, yeah, a lot of good points in there, right? So one point is that, hey, look, uh, the spec itself may not be complete, right? It may not specify every case. Not only, right, with semantics, does it specif have to specify what it does and what things do, but it should also include what things shouldn't happen, right? Which things are not allowed. Uh, in addition, how do you verify that the code you wrote actually conforms to this specification, <laughs> right? Can you actually prove that? Uh, but what about our code? What about other things conforming to specification? So what else has to conform to this specification? If I just throw you a C compiler and be like, use this compiler? No. Yeah. The compiler has to be known to conform to the specification. And the compiler can't do a whole lot with this. So we have these two sides, right? It's me and my code. I'm trying to write my code to the spec. But then I have a compiler who should have been written to the spec. Uh, 
but there's no guarantees on either side that this is actually the case, right? That this code, that both people are correctly implementing the specification. Uh, why is that? Because we're horrible people? Basically. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, there can be different versions, or it goes back to the ambiguity, right? The compiler writer may interpret one clause in this whole document one way, and I may interpret it another way. Uh, it could be that they just ignore it. Maybe the specification is just English. How easy is it to write English? Very. I mean, it's pretty easy compared to building a compiler that actually works, right? So maybe they say, hey, whenever you call this function, you're going to get uh, a litter of puppies. <laughs> right? And the compiler writers go, uh, no, I can't do that, so I'm going to ignore this part of the specification. But now you, the programmer, have to know which parts are puppies and are not implemented and which things are actually implemented, right? So we talk about this. Yeah, what about cases that the specification doesn't mention, right? Cases where the spec is incomplete. <coughs> but, so what is the purpose? So it has all these drawbacks, right? What's the point of having this English specification document? Exactly. Yeah, so hopefully this 538 page document is a little bit more abstract and easier to understand than this code of GCC, right? So that would be one thing. Uh, in addition to that, right, so we have the C language. How many C compilers are there? Lots, at least three or four, right? GCC, Clang, the Visual Studio C compiler. There's probably more, Borland and all these other ones, right? Uh, so how can we all even agree on what is C and what are the semantics of C? So to be able to write portable programs that we can take and run in any implementation of this specification, right? This is why having a spec is a good thing, or can be a good thing. OK. So a reference implementation. So the idea here is I give you <coughs> code, I give you a compiler, an interpreter, and I say, whatever this code does, that's what the C language is. Whenever, whenever you give this as input to this, whatever it does, that's what the C language is. Um, so for instance, I mentioned Ruby, right? Until, up until, all the way up to 2011. Does anybody know when Ruby on Rails first came out? A long time ago. Oh, I remember first programming in <laughs> 1 .0 or 0 1.0 or whatever it was. Uh, about 2006, 2005, 2006, right? So Ruby was starting to become a popular language but it still didn't have an official specification that you can go read and say, hey, this is how Ruby is implemented. What it has was it had an interpreter called the MRI, and that defined what was Ruby. Whatever that happened when you ran a code on that interpreter, that's what Ruby was and did. Um, so what are some of the be what is, what's some of the good things about that? Is it good? Is it bad? I feel like that's just as ambiguous as English. Just as ambiguous as English? In what sense? Uh, I mean, it's, it doesn't really define what can go into it. You just basically just trial and error. If it goes in and it comes out, you know it works. If it doesn't, then, then try again. Right, so there's two sides of that coin, right? So on one hand, hey, I know if I execute this program on this interpreter, whatever that output is, that's a valid Ruby behavior, right? So in some sense, it's if you think about it, it's precisely specified. The semantics are precisely specified given a specific input. Right? So this kind of goes back to the guess and test. So if we give it something, then we can figure out what it is. But the flip side of that is, well, what about all those other cases that I didn't test? Right? How can I get an understanding of the actual language? Right? So how are you going to answer that question? What does Ruby do on XYZ, or what are the semantics of ABC? How do you solve that with this? Yeah, you try it, right? That's the only way. You have to create a program, and you have to run that test program on the sample implementation and see what it does, right? What are some of the downsides? Is this, like, perfect? We already talked about this, right? So it's precisely specified. But what about other? <coughs> 
the start, them telling you that, oh, whatever the interpreter does is the right thing doesn't even get you in the ballpark. Yeah, I mean, just by itself, right, a reference implementation is basically useless because what are you going to do, guess? I mean, okay, you do have the grammar, so you could generate all possible programs, right, in that, in that language, but still, uh, you're not going to be able to run them all. And what do they mean? Like, how do you interpret those results? What else? So we talked about correctness in English specifications. Does this have a correctness problem? Yeah. Because the there's no uh, written specification for the interpreter, it's hard to know if whoever wrote the interpreter made an error or if that's really what it's really supposed so to be. So what if they do? What if they make an error? What if there's a bug in the implementation? Well, their, their statement here is that, yeah, that's exactly what it's supposed to do. And that's exactly what happens, right? They actually, bugs become part of the language <laughs> because applications have already been written taking advantage of this behavior. And so those bugs persist in the language itself. Uh, this is, uh, anybody doing web programming stuff, there's so much crazy hacks and like CSS and JavaScript and all that, and it's because of this, right? They become de facto parts of the standard that everybody has to support. Um, so what about portability? Does this affect portability at all? <coughs> Using a reference implementation? So with English specification, right, we could count on, hey, multiple implementations of that specification, right? What if you're running uh, a MIPS machine, right? And Matt's Matt never tested his interpreter on MIPS, right? So yeah, what if your implementation doesn't run on your platform? You're just screwed. You'll never know if that's a valid program. You literally can't execute the interpreter, so you can't understand what is a Ruby program on that machine. <coughs> All right. So formal specifications. Right. So here we're going to actually we're going to say, okay, let's deal with the problems of English, and we'll say, hey, English is a terrible language to describe a specification in because it's very ambiguous. So let's use math and let's describe things formally. So what are the, some of the benefits here? Has anybody learned a language like this? Not a functional one. Not a functional one? What language did you learn like this? Um, oh, Elvin. <laughs> cool. Any programming language? <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. So what are some of the benefits? What are some of the pros and cons? Yeah. Well, one of the pros is that if you do actually spend the time to read it and digest it and actually understand it, you do have a better grasp of it than you would get through any other way. Right. Uh, the cons are just the sheer amount of time that it would take to, to do that. Yeah, right. So if the language is formally defined, unlike English, is that going to leave cases that are maybe not specified or, no. right? So it should be the case that all parts of the language have an exact and precise definition, right? So there's never any doubt. You should be able to, from the formal specification, understand what does it mean in this specific context? What happens if I do uh, take a dereference and then take an address and then access a field and then take the dereference of that, right? Uh, what are some other benefits? So if we have this all in math, essentially, or we have some kind of formalism, what does that allow us to do then? Proofs. Proofs. Yeah, right? We can actually try to prove things about programs written in this language. right? And actually, that's where a lot of the work in formal specifications comes from. And that's where I've been exposed to it. It's not so much that you do this, well, they don't really do this with the intent that you'll learn how to program the language like this. They do this so that we can statically analyze the code to try to understand what it could do, to try to detect vulnerabilities. Um, so the downside, 
pretty difficult to understand. So if you don't believe that, uh, here's a snippet of formal semantics defined using a technique called abstract interpretation of JavaScript. Anybody think they know JavaScript? No. <laughs> First thing I read, I can read the query. So actually, um, it, this is one of those things that of course I show this up here and it's meant to be complicated. Uh, but actually when you break this down and you take each thing piece by piece and you understand exactly what each column's doing, it actually is straightforward and precise, and it says things like uh, basically how to handle if statements. So basically you evaluate the expression. If it's true, then the next thing you're going to execute is the true branch. Otherwise, the next thing that's going to be executed is the false branch. Uh, always here. So basically it abstractly represents the machine and then specifies how the machine execution state changes as it goes through. Uh, so this is from one of my, uh, one of the professors at UC Santa Barbara, who I borrowed this from. I did not come up with it. Uh, but yeah, it shows it, how to do everything. Assignment, delete, uh, defining new functions, while loops, everything. The whole language can be specified this way. But I would agree with you that it's a little bit obtuse. You kind of have to already know the language to understand what this means and what it represents. Okay, so now that we've seen kind of how to define semantics, right, we've seen different ways of doing that, um, what things need to be specified? What do semantics actually need to define? When you think about your own self, when you go to a programming language, what are the things you want to know about this language? Yeah. Control structures. Control structures, in what sense? program's execution, evaluate the expression that's within parentheses. If that expression evaluates to true, then execute inside the branch, otherwise go outside. Um, how do you, what about telling if something's true? Is that part of the semantics? Is true the same in every language? No. No, right? It's a lot different. In, um, I'm trying to think, PHP is like the worst example of things being true or not. I think you take the string containing a zero is equal to false. You compare that because it automatically tries to cast the string containing zero to an integer and then zero, the integer is equal to false in PHP, which is insane. Um, right? Some things have literal true and false in C, what's true and what's false? Zero is false. Right, zero is false, but everything else is true, which is also kind of weird, right? It's not quite as explicit as you want. But all of these things, right, they get into the, these, ha for you to actually program in this language, right, you have to know this. In some languages like Lisp, you, uh, the empty list is considered false, right? It's not actually, I mean, it's not false, but if you say if something and it's the empty list, then it won't execute that instruction. So uh, you need to know these things. What other things? <coughs> so we have if statements, conditionals, Loops, while statements, what's the difference between a while and a do while? Do while is just one iteration first. Right, but you have to know this, right? It's not obvious. You have to learn this. This is part of your understanding of the language. Could you think of other control structures? Switch statements. Switch statements, how do switch statements work? Um, Lisp actually has an unless statement, which is like an if statement, but opposite. So unless this thing is true, execute this code branch. Sometimes it can make the code a lot more easier to read. Um, yeah. Uh, what are some other things? So those are all the control structures. Is that all you need? No. No. What else? Yeah. If you declare variables, you need to know where you can expect to be able to access them. Oh, what does it even mean to declare a variable, right? You have to go all the way down to the bottom. That's why these things have to be so long, right? What does it mean? What does it mean to declare a variable? What does it? In some languages like Python, you don't need to declare variables, right? 
They just pop into existence whenever you use them, <laughs> right? But then when we get into defining variables, right, where is that identifier, where can it be used to refer to that variable's declaration? Right, so scoping rules. What are the scoping rules? What other things? Types. Say that again? Types. Types. What about types? Everything about types, right? Types are its own semantic section, right? So what are the types? What are the basic types? How does the programmer construct new types? Right, whenever you create a structure with different fields, right, you're actually constructing a new type. Um, what does it mean? How, when can two types be equal to each other, right? When can we transfer from one to the other, or when do we have to explicitly cast it? What does it mean to explicitly cast? What if we mess up a cast? What if we say that something is a dog when really it's an apple, right? What happens? Is the program gonna stop, or is it gonna keep going? <coughs> yeah, the apple's probably not gonna bark. Um, anything else? <laughs> Depends on if it has the method or not. Memory addressing? Memory, yeah, can we even access direct raw memory, right? In C, we can do that. In other languages, we can't. Uh, what about functions? Is there anything important about functions, or are they just super obvious when you first learned about them? What does it output? How many parameters does it have? Right, what's the return? How do I get the return value? How many parameters does it have? How do I call it? What are the types of those parameters? Uh, can the calling function modify any of the parameters, right, in the callee's environment? All kinds of stuff, right? I will think. Variable, we talked about variables, functions, parameters, types. What about operators, right? What does it mean when you do ID plus ID, right? On most languages, it's addition, sometimes, <laughs> unless it's string concatenation, right? So how do you know? In you know, some languages like PHP, you have to use the stupid dot operator to concatenate strings. It becomes really annoying. And you also have like yeah, uh, you can actually don't have operator overloading in C, but in C++ you oh, do. I didn't know. So yeah, uh, you can, yes, yeah, so you can overload operators. And if you do any Haskell stuff, you see that people overload operators like crazy, which makes it very difficult to understand what's going on. Uh, what happens when there's a problem in your code? Does your code always run smoothly 100% of the time? Sure. <laughs> I wish. Yes. yes. For all you know. <laughs> So what happens when an error occurs? Many things. Try in a corner. Hopefully your program overflow. doesn't do that. <laughs> stack overflow. How do you know that a stack overflow occurred? How do you know that it occurred? Oh, oh, you're saying you use stack overflow. <laughs> I was talking about a website. An actual, an actual stack, stack overflow. overflow. <laughs> I'm gonna complain to them. Like, yeah. Typically your, your environment will give you some feedback. If it's a compiler error, it tells you, hey, idiot, you messed up here. What about a runtime error? Then you have to rely on your operating system and your debugger. Mm, kind of. Your, uh, your program will break some stuff. Yeah, right, exceptions. So what, what are the semantics behind exceptions? Uh, can you, you know, do you have to, like in Java, do you have to catch every possible exception of a method that's called? Do you have to state every method, every function has to declare exactly what it can throw um, in, or in C or C++, how are exceptions handled, right? They're actually handled very differently. Um, in languages like Lisp, they're actually the exception handling system is completely different. You can actually catch uh, an exception up the stack, change things, and then re-execute whatever you were executing. You can just go back and continue executing there. It's actually really crazy. Huh? Yes. That's cool. Yeah, it's actually really, they have a lot of really cool stuff. Uh, Control structures we talked about. What about constants? This would be pretty trivial, right? But what does it mean for something to be constant? Always accessible. Always accessible, and what's the flip side of that? And unchanging. And unchanging, right? So it means that you can't assign to something that's constant. You can't change something that's constant. Does the language actually enforce this or not? That's something you need to know, right? Methods, classes, we didn't even talk get into object orientation, right? But you think that's a whole other set of semantics, like, what does it mean with classes? Can I inherit from multiple classes? What happens when I inherit in C++ from multiple classes and they have the same method with the same signature? Right? How do I even define the same method? Right? That's kind of a fundamental question. So 
Semantics is really about trying to answer all these questions and define what does a language actually do. Um, so it's something I want you to think about because I think these things, we kind of take them for granted after we learn them. We're like, oh, of course method calls work this way, or of course operator overloading happens like this. But really, this is just the particularities of your specific programming language. Uh, so what we're going to do now, we're going to dive into several different types of semantics to try to understand that. So there's a few things that are important here. A, that semantics are essentially arbitrary. Uh, you as the language designer, you can define your semantics however you want. Right? You don't have to have function calls. They don't have to be function calls. They don't have to be, uh, you can do it kind of however you want. So we're going to look at different types of semantics so that we can understand, in some sense, the design space, and in another sense, to understand that these aren't handed <coughs> down by programming gods that came to us and said, this is how thou shalt program <laughs> computers. Right? These are like humans coming up with these things. OK, so what are declarations? Defining something. Why? Why do we want to define things? <coughs> so that we can use things, right? So we can use them. Yeah, right? So uh, do we always have to declare everything? Depends on the language. Depends on the language, right? So yeah, so you know, sometimes for some, I'm using kind of an abstract term, constructs here, so some kind of language constructs, uh, we've, before we actually use them, we need to explicitly declare, hey, I'm going to use a variable that's type is, a sh is an integer, and the name of that variable is foo, right? So we can give it a specific name, right? So this would be an integer whose name is i. We have declared. Do we always have to do this? What's the difference between explicit and implicit declarations? <clears throat> might be something like every time a program starts, there's just something i already inserted in the exception or something. Yeah, right? So it could be, yeah, so in, well, implicit could be two things, actually. That's a good point. Uh, one thing could be the language actually defines um, a variable. I think in some languages, if you do like a for loop, it automatically creates an i variable or an iterator variable or an index variable. Uh, I'm not 100% certain. But other things like in Python, right? I don't have to declare anything, right? I can just say target is equal to test value plus 10. And while it's interpreting this, it'll see target and it'll go, OK, great. This must be a new variable named target. What are some of the pros and cons of these approaches? If you mean to do one variable and accidentally mistype it, you just made a new variable? Yes. It's a huge problem in Python, right? <laughs> if, I, if I forgot the R in target, and was just target, right? I won't know later on. Later on, maybe I'll get an undefined variable, but maybe not, right? Maybe the program still executes because target was actually defined earlier, and when I use it again later, it's using the old value that didn't get updated with this test value, right? What about the downsides? Is it super, yeah? It's unclear what target is unless you know what test value is as well, and you know that it's supposed to be some. Yeah, it's kind of hard to see if you're just looking at this code. It's not really clear. Is target supposed to be declared here? Is it not? Is it something else? What about the other way? So what are some of the drawbacks of explicit? Yeah. It's kind of, it's very rigid and you have to, you know, okay, I'm gonna have these integers, these, you know, all of my variables first, and now I'm gonna go do something with them. Right, yeah, it all seems kind of backwards in some at least it feels that way to me when I'm programming like in C. And I have to put all the declarations at the top of a block or a method, right? It's like, well, I don't actually, while I'm writing it, I don't know precisely every variable I'm going to need, right? So I kind of actually do it in more of an implicit style and then go back and put in the declarations that I need, right? So definitely some trade-offs. Uh, what else can be, I don't know, kind of nice about explicit declarations? Anything else? Because it's explicit, you always know where, where it's defined, what it's going to be called, maybe what it was originally um, what's the word, um, initialized to. 
Yeah. And we can tell that, right? So we can tell by looking at this, but who else, what else can tell? Anyone what was that? Three, <coughs> Anyone else that looks at our code? OK, good. Yes? Yeah, it actually does increase the, in some sense, the documentation. Right? You're declaring, OK, these are the variables I'm going to use. And then later on, you can see how they're used. What about the compiler? Right? Actually, I believe, I don't know that I have proof of this, but I suspect that in C, the reason why you have to do this at the beginning is so the compiler can easily go through and see for every function or block exactly what variables are being used, what's their type, what's their size, so it can allocate space correctly for them. Um, actually makes the compiler's job a lot easier, right? So even if ex implicit declarations were great for programmers, and they are, they have benefits, right? Uh, this is actually better for the compiler writer, so, you know, if I control the spec, I'll be like, yeah, we're definitely doing this. <laughs> it's a lot easier. Okay. So we can declare things like this. So part of this declaration, what kind of... What are some concepts that are involved in here that we haven't covered that probably have their own semantic definitions? How types work. How types work. What else? Assignment. What do you do with assignment? Assignment, well, just the first way. How mathematics, how the mathematics of adding, subtract, subtracting, et cetera work? That actually is a good point. Just this line, though. That is something we'll have to get into. The terminating character? Like for C in Java, it's the semicolon, but for uh, some other language, it could be pound or at. So terminating character, that's more syntax. At this point, we don't really care. All we know is we have a declaration here, and we know that a declaration is a type followed by what? An identifier. An identifier, right? So how do we know? So we say a specific name, right? But how do names work? Right? Is it obvious when you started programming, you were like, I know how to refer to variables and functions and the difference between the two? And well, there are some things that are illegal to, for languages, there are illegal identifiers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? So, uh, right? So, like, what, what, what is this name mean? When I declare a variable i, how... So long in some sense, how long is that declaration valid, right? Where else in the program can I use that variable i to refer to that thing? So what are some of the what are some of the possibilities? Based on scope? Yeah. Based on scope, what are some of the ways you could do it? Globally. Globally, right? So it could be that when I declare something, it's available for the entire program. Right? And when I'm saying entire program, I mean not, you know the entire program, right? Any part of the program can access that variable and that name. What else? Locally. Uh, Locally. Like just once, it, once you the leave function. the function that it's declared in. Yeah, so locally in the function or something like that? Just inside of a loop. Uh, just inside, like maybe just where it's actually used. What about just the file, right? Just uh, that variable is only allowed to be used within this one file which kind of breaks it down a little bit, that entire program. What about global? What would that mean? Across the entire, uh, everything that, that this particular program would need to access or could access. More global than that. Like other programs can access it. Yeah, right? Like, could you make it so that you declare variables that are global across all all programs that are ever written in that language? It'd be kind of cool to think about, right? It's like Wasn't that like <coughs> some of the predefined constants and names already in the language? Yeah, right. So, or, uh, I mean, how does Android do package names? How do you uniquely identify an Android app? It's like com dot something that's in it. Yeah, it's like the package name, right? It's com dot something that's something. Yeah. That something that's something has to be globally unique. Right? And that's how Google identifies that this is your app and that you wrote this app. And in the package manifest, it has that specific string, and that's how the OS knows, OK, this package really doesn't belong to this package name. Right? So it seems like a crazy idea to do this like globally across all possible programs. But actually, you, know, you can think about that. It would be really cool to think about, like, uh, I've heard some things of, 
you can basically essentially make all functions in the language that anybody writes globally accessible. So you could just kind of like publish them out on something. So you could call anybody's function, and it would pull down that code and actually execute it and I do whatever it's supposed I think to do. Intents are called intents. I think is what they're called. Uh, or is that something different? Something different. Oh, intents okay. are a way to do basically remote procedure calls. Oh, okay. Uh, no, this would be like programming in some new language like Java, right? And when you want to, instead of when you want to use a library, you have to like download the jar file and include it in your source code. You just call that function, and that function itself has a globally unique name. So the Java interpreter would know to go pull down that specific function from that file. It's pretty cool. It's some very unique names. Yeah. Yeah, right? That, that's the big problem with this, is how do you make, so this is why, um, this is why in Java and on Android, you use basically reverse domain name. That's kind of the idea here. OK, we talked about like function, right? So this is about kind of what we're looking at here, right, is how long, so when we declare something, when we declare a name, how long is it valid for? But what's the flip side to that? So this is saying. OK, if I declare something here, it's valid for a certain length of time or length of program execution or some part of the, le of the lexical scope of the program, right? What's the flip side of that? You can't reuse it as something different? Maybe, depending on the semantics, right? That's part of semantics is, is can you <coughs> declare something else, right? So the flip side is what happens when you see an identifier? What are you trying to do? What's the compiler trying to do when it sees an identifier? When it sees ID plus ID? It starts to add them. Add what? It, it attempts to, or probably does a type check, see if they can be added. Then if they can, it adds it. If they can't, it probably But adds them. what? Adds keep saying them. Whatever, right. whatever the type is. It's like it tries to associate the identifier with location and memory that holds the value that you want to perform an operation on. More abstractly than location, right? Really just the declaration. So the idea is exactly. So as the program is going through, in order to do type checking, in order to uh, actually perform this operation, right? How do we map a name, an ID that we see in the program to a declaration, right? Every see how these are kind of two sides of the same coin? Yeah. And one side we're saying, OK, how, when we declare something, how long is it valid? And the other way is, when I see an ID, how do I map that back to the declaration? Right? And so scope, right? So scope is essentially tries to define these two questions of how long is a declaration valid and how to resolve a name. So is scoping simple? No. <laughs> no, said somebody with too much personal experience with it. Right? Anybody ever get in trouble with scoping rules? Yeah. <laughs> right? Gets even a little bit crazier with object oriented languages because you have not only do you have scope, but then you have you know public, private, internal, friend on all the fields, and so I have visibility issues too. So what are the C scoping rules? What is so when we talk about scoping rules, we like to talk about this. Usually, we like to talk about this concept of how long are things valid for, right? So for instance, we talked about is every declaration global? You know, global. Or is every declaration whole program? Or is every declaration um, whole file? Or what's kind of the most basic level that declarations have in C? Locally on the stack. Locally on the stack. More abstract about that. We're not even thinking about a stack and everything. And just within, within a, a code block. There you go. Yeah. Right. So C uses block level scoping. So some languages do block level scoping, which means that things are available in a block. What's a block in C? Brackets. Curly braces. Curly braces. Right. Do you have to have if statements, function definitions to have curly braces? No. 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 How would you know that? I tried it. <laughs> I tried it. If you didn't just try it or have some one of your fellow classmates just try it, how would you find that out? Look at the specification. Close. What specification specifically are you going to look at of C? <laughs> it's compiler. Ooh, compiler <laughs> specification. The grammar, right? The grammar will tell you where those 
parentheses, where those braces are valid, right? And then the semantics say what that means, right? If the friends, if the curly braces don't mean anything, well, then it doesn't matter where they could go, right? Uh, but specifically here in C, you can create a block anywhere without a function definition, without an if statement. And so, what this means, when it has, what does this mean when we say it has like block level scoping? So it answers that first question, right? So anything defined in that block is only available inside that block, right? What about declarations that aren't in a block? Program. Program? Yeah. So uh, I put global here, but yeah. From the what we were talking about earlier, right? So if you declare something that's not in a block, it's global, unless you use the static keyword if you use the static keyword on a global declaration in C, it means that declaration is valid only in that file. Why would that be useful? Because you only want the file, or that, that particular piece of data to be only usable in that file and not outside of it. Yeah, it's, it's primitive information hiding, right? You're essentially saying, I want this global variable, but I want it private to this function, right? I don't, or, not this function, private to this file. I don't want other files to be able to include this to be able to access this global variable, right? So in some sense, it's a way to do private global variables, but it's a little bit weird because it's on the file level, right? Not a class level or anything like that. So what about JavaScript? Somebody familiar with JavaScript, what's JavaScript's scoping level? I saw some hand raised for JavaScript programmers. That was nonsense. a test. What was it? It's nonsense. It's nonsense? <laughs> it's absolutely crazy. It is crazy. But it has actually a well-defined uh, well defined scoping rules, which once you, hopefully when you understand the scoping rules, you understand how JavaScript works, it makes concepts a lot easier, in my mind. Anybody else want to take a stab? Yeah. Is it global? Global? No, that would be crazy. <laughs> a little, uh, kind of, not really, a little bit. Uh, it actually uses function level scoping. So this means that the braces don't matter, but anything defined, any variable defined within a function can be accessible within that function. Right? So it seems reasonable, right? Uh, except for the fact that sometimes you know, if you define a variable inside an if statement, if you think in C that variable is not accessible outside that if statement, it's not true in JavaScript. You can actually access that. Uh, so this is actually why, how people do namespacing in JavaScript. If you want to create your own little scope, you have to actually define a function and then immediately call that function. And that has the effect of using curly braces. All right, let's look at an example. So here we have a C program, include standard io.h. We have our main function. So here we're defining a scope, right, with the curly braces. We have a block, we're defining a scope. We have a smaller block within it. We have an int i, i is equal to 10,000, print out i. Then another block, print out i. So where is this i valid? And how do we know? In this block. In this block? Which block? How many blocks are there in this the three? Block. There's three blocks in the first inner block, right? There's actually two inner blocks. So everybody see how these blocks of a hierarchy, right? We have the outer block, and then we have two inner blocks here. So this is totally valid C code. You can compile this well. You can compile it. Wouldn't it say that the second I is not valid in that scope? This I? The second or the, this I? The one in the second block. This I? Yeah. Yeah, so what's the problem here? It's not declared. It's not declared, but I declared it right here. But <laughs> that's only in that block. So locally, that's wrong. So what's gonna happen when I try to compile this? It's gonna say we have to try it. Why is it important that we try to understand what the code's gonna do before we compile it? Because so yeah. we can make sense of what the compiler tells us. Yeah, so A, so a couple of reasons, right? So one is you really, I mean, as part of growing as a developer, programmer, computer scientist, right? You want to be able to look at code and reason about what it's going to do 
without actually running it through the compiler, right? It's very easy to do self-guided test and check, right? But really, we want to be able to, like, you need to, and I say this not just because in a general, like, computer science-y type way, uh, but because on exams, you're going to be giving snippets of code and saying, like, okay, what's this program going to output if it has these level scoping rules? Or it uses static scoping or dynamic scoping or all these different types of things, right? So you need to be able to look at code, be able to step through it, and know exactly what it's going to do without actually running it. Right? And this helps you reason about the code. So really also the goal is you want to look at this kind of like a scientist. Right? This is how I approach debugging too. It's like, okay, before doing this, what do I expect this program to output? Based on my knowledge of C and my understanding of the semantics of C, right? what do I expect this Compilation to output. So, do we expect this to work? No. 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 What do we expect the error message to be? Uh, variable I not type this scope. On which? Yeah. The second I. The second. The, the second block. Fourth I. Yeah. One, two, three, four. Yes. Yeah, right. Eight. This I. Yeah. So after we compile this, it's going to say error I undeclared first using this function. Right. And we see eleven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 10, 11, because there's an extra space somewhere. Um, so this is good. So this actually, now we were able to look at the code. We were able to verify that it actually did throw an error after we ran it, right? And so with, where this is really important is if we look at this and we say, yeah, this should be fine. It should output 10,000 and then output 10,000, right? If we do that and then we run it and go, oh, wow, weird, there's an error then you know there's something wrong with your understanding of the semantics and the execution, and you need to go fix that in your brain, basically, and change the way you're thinking about code so that that way you can predict these things. Cool, so where is this I valid? Yeah, just these three lines, right? And so when we see this I, Right? So now the process, we need to go in the reverse. So we see this declaration, we look at this I, and we're trying to map it to this declaration. And we see this I, we map it to this declaration. But when we see this I, there's no declaration to map it to. Right? So that is, at the basic level for a language like C and Java, this is what happens when you get an undeclared identifier. Right? It saw an ID, it tried to map it to a declaration, and it couldn't. That's the problem. 